I spend a lot of time uh, with with that, with with basically scouting new riders. Uh, I probably, you know, compared to your average team manager out there, I spend a lot less time in the team car these days at the bigger races. I, I let, you know, the directors that we have who are incredibly intelligent and capable people run the races. Uh, but what I do spend my time doing in, in lieu of that is looking at smaller races and understanding how those smaller races work and talking to people in South America, in Australia, uh, in Asia, uh, in the United States, obviously, uh, and hearing about, you know, what is this race like, uh, what qualities do you need to win it, and then looking at the, at the results from the races, not just from a pure this guy won, this guy was second, so on and so forth, but how did the race develop. I try to actually dig into to video clips if I can find them, dig into uh, articles in local newspapers and so on and so forth to see how the race developed, who is actually the strongest guy there. Because a lot of times in cycling you'll have maybe, especially in the lower divisions, one team that's able to sort of outfox a stronger individual. But if you can pick that stronger individual that was, you know, fourth or fifth place, even though he got outfoxed by a stronger team, you know, maybe pulling him into your team will pay dividends. So I, sp I spend a lot of time doing, uh, well, doing some pretty nerdy research on uh, guys that nobody else has heard of. Well, I mean, a, a good example uh, is Janier Acevedo, uh, who's had a little trouble with his knee this spring, but uh, he's a guy who incredibly talented. Uh, when we've done you know physiological tests with him, he he, he comes in. As, as one of the strongest athletes uh, I've ever seen, just from the physiological capacity standpoint. Uh, but he was racing for a small team in Colombia. I, I asked him, uh, you know, after he won this, this uh, stage of, of the USA Pro Cycling Challenge last year, I said, well, you know, where were you when you were 22, 23? Because, uh, you know, you're winning races at 26, but I, but I need to understand where you were at 22 years old. And he said, well, um, I was riding a bike, but not racing a bike. And I said, well, okay, so were you doing big long rides? He's like, no, I was riding to work to pick potatoes. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, that's the reason he doesn't have any results from when he was 22 years old is because he was working in the potato fields and riding his bike to and from work. So, you know, there's a guy who, if you, if you said, well, I've never heard of him before, I've, I've never seen him in the U23 ranks, you'd totally overlook an incredibly strong, robust physiological talent because he was out picking potatoes in the field when he was young. Um, you know, other examples of that, uh, Phil Gaiman, he's a great guy, uh, won some, you know, race for us early on in the year. You know, Phil's one of those guys who in the U.S. he went to college. He, he, didn't, he, he didn't say, I'm going to forego uh, everything for the sport of cycling because he wasn't a cyclist when he was 18 years old. He'd, you know, ridden a bike around a little bit, but he, he wasn't trying to race bikes. Uh, he really only started racing bikes in his later years, and so he just sort of totally missed out on where you would traditionally recruit an athlete from, you know, in the, in the U23 arena, uh, and really didn't come into his own until he was 26, 27 years old. Uh, and so, but again, I know that in my background, I thought, oh, you know, this guy's got a, you know, university degree. This is where he came from. This is, a, of course, his progression hasn't been as fast as uh, some other guys at the top level of the sport. So... Uh, I, I think you, you know, the, I try to be creative with it and, and I try to take an unbiased approach, meaning I don't always look at the traditional avenues of recruitment. Oh, sure. I mean, absolutely. I, I think, you know, Chris Froome is sort of a great example of a, of a guy who came from an area that n normally it would be very difficult to get recognized no matter how talented uh, you are. And that, you know, that type of physiology is out there for sure. Uh, you know, it could be a kid uh, eating donuts in Kuala Lumpur right now. I mean, you know, and how, how do you attract them into the sport? How do you uh, develop them from there in those sort of more challenging environments? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a big question and, and, um, and something that I think eventually will be solved and eventually will lead to, you know, even a, a much higher level the sport because for sure you know the the you know just from a darwinian physiological standpoint the broader the base of talent the higher 
you know, the pinnacle is going to be. And so when we start seeing more and more um, kids from Africa, from South America, from Asia, uh, coming into the sport, it's going to broaden the physiological base. And that means it's going to be more difficult to, to get to the top. And that means that the, 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 you know, the highest level of human performance will, you know, will be higher. I mean, it's, it's, um, I think it's silly to think that, that cycling has m managed to find the, the, the best possible, you know, physiological specimens um, based on sort of the, the narrow demographic group that, that it's drawn from over these years. Uh, I think when we start broadening that demographic and globalizing it, I think, you know, perhaps there's a, a kid out there that, that you know, that, uh, you know, that makes Chris Froome, you know, look like a grandma going up a hill. That would be something to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's possible. <laughs>you know I, I i never try to precisely quantify what success means uh because i really feel like uh that that the ideal in this sport is that you've managed to get the absolute best out of your athletes you've managed to get the best out of your staff you've managed to get the best out of the team as a whole unit uh and if you do that and you really step away from a race even if you finish 93rd if you step away from the race and say we've really e extracted the best we possibly could out of these athletes and and the staffing and the strategy and you know nutrition and everything else then we've been successful and i just try to focus on that and use that as the guide for success not the actual end result sometimes the end result ends up being first and that's incredible when it happens uh and and, and I think you, you can see it in this team uh, more than any other is that when we do win, I mean, we really celebrate because, you know, we don't necessarily go in thinking, well, you know, if we don't win, we haven't been successful. We go in thinking, okay, we, we've done everything we could. And now, you know, let the pieces fall where they may. And, um, and so when we win, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable experience. But to me, the measure of success is what went into that. And if, if you've done that correctly, whether it's win or loss, um, of course it's more fun when you win. But, but the, the measure of success to me is, is measured you know, before the final result of the race. <laughs> it's, I, you know, I, we've got, our team's good at celebrating. That's, <laughs> I, I, you know. <laughs> I shouldn't disclose exactly how we celebrate, but um, yeah, there I, we have a fun-loving team. We always have had a fun-loving team. Uh, one thing that I always like to see is that the guys celebrate together. Uh, they really do feel like it's a team victory and not an individual victory, and that's really important to me across the board. I mean, every every time I see w when one of our guys wins, you know, there's always hugs from his teammates. There's always equal celebration from his teammates and not just the the guy who won and and you know to me from a cultural standpoint that's so important to, to have it be that way um finally uh i'm going to ask you to imagine yourself squeezing back into lycra uh, <laughs> uh, if you could be any other rider in the current professional peloton who would you be and why any other rider other than myself, oh, I can just I can just f float my boy, boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. That's a tough one. I think I think uh, in this day and age, it would be interesting to be Quintana. Um, you know, he he obviously comes from Colombia, comes from a, a little bit off the beaten path from traditional cycling, um, but he seems to really. Uh, really have sort of a, a winner's fire about him. Um, he's, a, he's a little guy, but everything I've heard from, from the guys, he does not get pushed around in the peloton at all. Even he might be a little guy, but he's got a lot of bite. Uh, so I think, I think he'd probably be a, a fun guy to, to sit in his body for the next 10 years and see, see where it goes.